Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson from Four Corners of the Board, and today I'm going to be looking at God's Forge. Now in this game of dice rolling, you are an elite spellcaster looking to control the last pieces of a resource called Ethereum, which was once plentiful, but is now only found in one place, the God's Forge. Now I picked this game up because sometimes I enjoy rolling dice and seeing what I can use with them, much like a game called Dice Throne. I was hoping this one would be similar, but since I can cast spells and build up my own tableau from cards in my hand, it sounds like there might be a little more strategy on uh, what you want to play and when to play that in the game. So did I enjoy this game? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and I'll come back for my final thoughts on God's Forge. So here's God's Forge set up for three players. Each player gets a set of colored dice and places their scoring marker on the life track depending on how many players there are. For a three player game, everyone starts with 25 health. Place the Veil Stones in their place, then deal four cards to each player and place the rest in the draw pile. The game is played until there's only one player left alive, and each round will have an upkeep phase, a forge phase where you're going to be rolling your dice, then a reveal phase where people show the cards they are casting, and then the attack phase where everyone attacks the person on their left and defends against the person on their right. Let's have a quick look at the cards. There are two types of cards, creations, which are in silver color and will stay out in front of you, and spells, which have a gold color and are usually one-time effects. But each card operates the same way. Here we have the cost, what you have to roll to cast this card. Reveal effects, which happens the first time you reveal this card during the reveal phase. If there are any reoccurring effects on the card, attack or defense value, and any other effects. So each round will start with the upkeep phase. During this phase, every player can discard two cards from their hand. Then everyone draws until they have four cards in their hand. Any creations that have an update effect happen now. Each player will then roll their dice during the forge phase. Players can re-roll a die twice, either the same die two times or two different dice once. Let's quickly talk about dice rolls and veil stones. In this game, a 1 and 6 on the die are special. A 1 is a wild card. It can be used as any other die from 2 through 6. A 1 can also be added to another die as if it were a 6. So if I had a 5 and needed to get an 11, I could add the one die to it to make it an 11. It can also be used as either an odd or even die if required. And Veil Stones are collected when you have an unused 6 or 1 or dice that add up to 6 at the end of the reveal phase. Veil Stones are sometimes required to cast a spell. They can be used to power some spells or creations and can also be used to shift a die up or down one pip during the forge roll, but you can never change a die into a 1. When you've decided on which card you want to craft and you have the correct dice for it, place the card face down in front of you alongside any veil stones you've used to shift your dice. If you want to empower the spell that you're just casting, you must also set those aside now as you have to decide that before the cards are revealed. You typically only cast one card in a round unless the card you're casting allows you to cast an additional card. If you cannot cast a card or do not want to cast a card, you take four veil stones and do not use any of your dice. Once everyone is ready with their card, everyone reveals their card. Any card with reveal effect will take that action now. If you have any dice that are 6 or add up to 6 that were not used to cast your card, you can take Veil Stones for them. Once the reveal phase is done, you move to the attack phase. Add up all the attack values you have and any abilities that have a pink border that can be triggered. Any creature that can be empowered would have the Veil Stone spent now to empower them. And, since all damage is done simultaneously, if you need to sacrifice a creature, the creature would still do damage first, then give the sacrifice benefit as well. You can only sacrifice your own creations in play. Sacrifice creations are discarded. All damage is then added up and applied to the person on your left, and any damage that is dealt to you, you subtract your defense value from that damage. All players will then adjust their health track. After all the attacks, defense, and special abilities are applied, if one player is now below one life, they are eliminated from the game. Whoever killed the player gets three Veil Stones, and the eliminated player's cards are discarded. And if this was the first player eliminated during this game, then each subsequent round, all remaining players will receive an additional 7 damage during the attack phase. The last player standing is the winner. 
In case of all players dying on the same round, whomever is the least damaged is the winner. Now, let's get back to the table to see what I thought about God's Forge. So, first let's go through theme and components. The theme of spellcasters fighting against each other is nothing new, and really this game doesn't add anything new to the mix. Each side of the dice represents a different element, so numbers 2 through 5 are fire, air, water, and earth, 1 is ethereum, and 6 is veil stones, I guess. But honestly, it doesn't matter, because what you need to cast the spells really doesn't fit with the elements you roll. I need an 11 plus and two odd number dice to cast a metallic dragon. I'm not sure I see the connection there. So the theming was disconnected and uninteresting. So on to the components. First off, I have a pet peeve. This box is way too big for the components. It's a deck of cards, four sets of dice, and a few tokens. This should be in a box a quarter the size. The only thing that needs to be in a box this size is honestly a scoring track, which is really unnecessary. So I was unpressed by that. The dice themselves are fine, uh, but boring, honestly. I would have liked to see something different with them. Maybe a 6 showing the Veil Stone, or the number 1 showing Ethereum, or just something, not just plain 6-sided dice. Now, I do like the cards. Uh, they're not the best quality, but I do like the art and the layout of these cards. The art is, of course, very subjective, but I enjoyed it on the creation cards. Um, the spell cards, which are really just geometric patterns, not as much. But they are easy to read, and they are well laid out. The rest of the components, the player markers and the veil stones, you know what? They're standard quality. So, on to the gameplay. Yeah, this is where the game kind of falls apart for me. I will say that just about everyone I've played with wanted to play another round right away, but then they said that they're done with the game. The dice rolling is a weird mechanism, as you only have two re-rolls, and it feels very restrictive. If I had used the Yahtzee mechanism, where I can re-roll as many dice as I want for two re-rolls, I think I would have preferred that. But as it stands, it seems even more random, as it's very difficult to get the more powerful creations out. Now, they did try and mitigate that with the Veil Stones. And getting something that generates Veil Stones uh, early on in every round is extremely useful. And if you're lucky enough to get a big creation out early on in the game, then it is very difficult to stop you. And, if you can hit someone in the first round or second round with a powerful spell that does 8 or more damage, it's huge, since you only start with a maximum of 30 points if you're only playing with two players. Now, I did like that you receive four Veil Stones for choosing not to cast or being unable to cast a card, but that's a huge disadvantage, because each round people's armies are getting stronger and stronger. Yes, you're probably going to be able to play a larger card next round, but honestly, at what cost? Now, the game does have some decisions points to be made once the dice have been rolled. As you saw from the walkthrough, the yellow player had a few choices to do uh, with their dice, as having dice left over that would get you Veil Stones is extremely useful. But it's usually after you've rolled all your dice, you kind of see what you can do with them. There ended up being a lot less strategy than I was hoping for. You just rolled your dice and played whatever card you could in the round. It wasn't You couldn't go into the round saying, I want to play this card next, because honestly, it just depends on the dice roll. The games only last 20 to 30 minutes, and it really seemed to wrap up very quickly, especially if you're playing with more than two players. That extra 7 points of damage per round after the first person is dead makes sure the game only lasts a round or two more. So, all in all, I didn't hate the game, but I really didn't like it either. It was okay, but not something I'm going to be coming back to in the future, and it will be quickly be forgotten in my group. I think if you want a game like this, I would much prefer to play something like Dice Throne, or even Dice Forge. As much as I like the cards, this is one I just can't recommend. So, that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at coolstuffinc.com.